there's a little bit slightly better way to write this, but this is just a really basic way using a basic object to show you. We have a public variable on that object, and we're going to change it at runtime. So let's go ahead and set a breakpoint on that guy, F9. And then we will go ahead and let me actually cover this real quick, and then we'll run this. So if we're close, so we're taking the upper left-hand corner and our current position, taking the magnitude of that vector. It's an easy way to check the length. And we're basically saying, hey, if we're within uh, one unit, one meter um, of that object, then just go ahead and destroy it. So this is a common way of checking length between two objects, wherever they are in space. We're, we're dealing with 3D. So we just want to know, like, hey, are you close enough here within one length? Sure, we're going to uh, destroy the game object, increment our score. So let's go ahead and switch back to Unity. Everything compiles OK. We don't see any red down there. We're going to attach to Unity. And then we will run our game. Switch back over here. Give it a second to finish its processing. Come back to me. Mark, you know any good jokes? <laughs> mm, no. No. Not one. <coughs> oh, there we go. Okay, now it came back. So let's go ahead. <laughs> I can open another can. You know, you said, <laughs> you said not one, and that was the joke, and it worked. That's my joke. We're going to play this again. Everything's kind of slowing down here. It's like, I want lunch. Not one. Not no, one. It didn't work that time. <laughs> oh, there we go. A little delay. We get to listen to some good music. All right, so let's touch this coin. Now, notice, it's, we heard the sound. The coin flew up, and then we hit our break point here. Our coin score is currently zero. Let's F5 this. There we go. Two, three. There we go. Fair. We picked up three coins. We have three as our coin score. I know who's buying lunch. <laughs> Super. <laughs> I'm kind of getting hungry. You're going to hear my stomach growl soon. <laughs> All right. So really, really easy way to write some score code there. Uh, we simply take the parent, take that coin, make its parent to camera. So no matter where we move, it's going to move with the camera. Uh, move it up into the upper left-hand corner, and as soon as we get close, then we just increment our score. Sounds good. Real easy. All right, let's talk about level death detection. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you it was a late night last night. All right, level death detection. Um, let's go back to our scenes here and load up this guy. And you'll notice, let's run off our world. You want to say it again? One. You know, I think it's just funny, like list, happy, listening to people over here, non-industry people talk about like well, level death detection and stuff. But whatever it was you just said about the world was funny too. Level. <laughs> All right, here we go. All right, I'm gonna come off here and jump. Dude, why'd you do that? You're not very good. <laughs> Actually, in my environment, in my terrain, I actually had a level end on there. So let's go ahead and stop this, because that's giving us a little delay when we play here. Play that, and you'll notice I'm going to run off this level, and I'm just going to fall and fall and fall and fall. Goodbye. Ow. All right? There's no level death detection. I'm, I'm falling. Oh, there's my level up there. Wait, can I see it? No. All right. How can we overcome this uh, serious limitation in our game? One thing that I like to do, um, and this was a question as a beginner I had, how do you do uh, boundaries and levels, like level edges? Really easy way. So let's find out where we kind of want to do this, maybe around here-ish. Game object, 3D object, let's create a cube. And in our, not in every direction, but I want to scale it out maybe here and here. There and there. Let's see what that looks like. Well, that's pretty big. So notice, I'm just taking a, literally a flat cube. Uh, it's got a little bit of depth to it. And let's make it 
So even if somebody finds a way to jump towards the edge of our world, they're, they're kind of still limited a little bit. All right. That looks good. Um, the depth, I think, looks okay. As we get closer, we actually see our shadows on there. So we've got this level now. I can run off my world. And you can clearly see it down there. A lot of it's fine lighting. Oof. And I hit it. Well, that's no fun. Uh, I can turn off its mesh renderer. Voila. Play. You might guess we'll still have another issue. Have you ever been on a glass bottom boat, Mark? I have. You have? All right. So this might look familiar then. Yes. I okay. was on the top of the CN Tower about a month ago, which has a similar kind of Awesome. Thing. Yeah. I like your endless faller better. <laughs> so, well, the problem is we have a an invisible collider, right? A collider is not a visual object. It's it's something that you've told Unily about this this region, this big box. It doesn't have to be visible. But now we can use the exact same type of code that we just did uh, for our picking up a coin. And on here, we're going to say level end, and then we'll look at this code. That's going to be one giant coin. This is literally all the code that we need. On trigger enter. So we need to go ahead and make this a trigger. I mean, we can make it a collider and run around on there, but there's no, there's no reason to run around on that. Um, my cube is right here. Let's call this border instead of cube. Let's turn this into a trigger. Why? Because I don't care about something landing on it and running around. That's worse for, uh, for performance. I mean, although, there's a highly optimized physics engine here. But I just want to say, hey, when something touches this, let me know. So save that change. Speaking of save changes, another Unity 5 edition. Um, if I make a couple scene changes and then I undo it, it used to keep my scene dirty in a sense. It, I would go and play it or I would be prompted to save. Uh, with Unity 5, now I can undo and it keeps my scene clean. Mm -hmm. So for those using source control, it actually helps quite a bit because uh, if you're just making a couple changes and undoing them, it doesn't dirty your scene, so you don't have to resave it again. Cool little workflow. That was actually highly requested as well. All right, back to this simple code here. On trigger, enter. Uh, when our player hits this trigger, that's it. He's dead, Jim. Ha. We can do whatever we want to do with that at that point in time. Uh, in this case, I have a player health class component, a player health component on the player. So if we go and we look at vamp kit again, we just looked at player score. There's a player health also on that character. And so when we hit, that's when we say, uh, our vampire, give me that component. Actually, I just realized we could have done a little shortcut that I did not do. Um, when we collide, we actually already have a reference. So let's go back to the coin one quick second, because I realized I could have optimized this code a little bit better. So good learning exercise here. Uh, when I hit my coin, it passed me my Vamp Kids Collider right here. I don't need to search for it on startup. It's already given it to me when I collide. And since I'm only ever colliding with a coin once, I can just use that and ask for its component. In other words, I could have just done this. This is a little bit optimized. I could have said other dot game object dot get component. I, and I never would have had to do anything in awake. So if you're looking, watching this at home and wondering, hey, you could have made this better. Well, hopefully I just caught that. <laughs> I will have the, the fixed version in the uh, download source. Just a minor change here. But anyway, that's what I'm doing on level end. As soon as I hit my trigger, I'm just getting its health and calling die. And we don't care what die does. The important thing is detecting that collision here. And so we can see now, when we run off the edge of our world, we'll, get, we'll call on trigger enter, and he will die. Oh, he's a vampire, so his die is just uh, trigger off a bunch of bats and make him ideally disappear, although in this scene we don't make him disappear. Cool. All right, let's talk about input and mobile input. In the standard assets package, we now have some built-in mobile input that we can use. That was uh, one of the questions I hear a lot from developers. Hey, I want 
some sort of touch interface on my screen. What works on the desktop does not work on mobile. So, uh, and you can buy, you can write your own code. You can buy packages from you in the asset store to do it. I've done them. Uh, I have bought packages to do that. And there's some really, really good packages out there that do that. A lot of customizable joysticks. Uh, but Unity has provided some basic ones built in to these standard assets. Now, the input system in Unity uh, reads values. Uh, you can say input dot get button down fire one. And if you're pressing your left control button or your left mouse button, uh, it will turn true. And that one actually works for a touch on mobile. But when you actually try to read input like your left and right on your keyboard, input dot get access horizontal maps to your left and right arrows. And if you're saying, well, how I, I'm new to Unity. How do I know what horizontal means? Because I had the same questions. I mean, um, laying down flat. <laughs> edit project settings <laughs> input. So edit project settings input. If we look at the word horizontal maps to the left and right arrows, the A and D key. If we, re if we say input um, dot get access vertical, that's going to map to the down and up. And those are values between negative one and positive one. So if I hold down the left key, it's going to go pretty quickly to negative one. If I let go, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go back to zero. And you can control how fast it moves back to zero, to one, to negative one with the sensitivity value. But anyway, I digress here. I just want to show you where these settings are. And also like fire one, it's the left control or the mouse zero. In other words, the left mouse button. So on uh, keyboard, it works great. But when you try to um, use your left and right arrows on a uh, phone, you find just swiping in the air, you don't actually have that. So there's no keyboard. Now. One of the ways of doing that is you throw an image on the screen and you kind of track the users, how they're dragging that image around, or just tracking touch. Uh, Unity does support touch through the input.touch class, but you have to kind of write your own there. There are third-party assets like EasyTouch. Now, they have given us some code, Unity and the standard assets, in the cross-platform input class. So let's go ahead and kind of look at that here, because in our main scene, so let's go back to our scenes, main, All right. We can find, if we look for cross-platform input initialize, notice it refers to these values here, cross-platform input. And we have a menu item. I mentioned earlier that you can really script out Unity's environment. Pretty, pretty powerful. Um, there's a lot of assets that rely on this code. So notice, this says menu item mobile input enable. So this actually adds this menu right there. That code adds this to the interface. And when you say enable, you have enabled mobile input. You'll need to use the Unity Remote app uh, on a connected device to control your game in the editor. Now, there's an asterisk surrounding this. There's not a Unity Remote app for Windows Phone. Uh, there's one for uh, Android and iOS. I think both of those have source code available. Um, the process to test on a Windows Phone, I'll show you here, is actually really easy. So you just deploy it to your phone and, and test out the package, which we'll, I'll show you here. So I'm going to say, OK, let me make sure I have my code open here, which I do. And back to Unity. Oh, my dialog is preventing me from seeing this. OK, we say OK. Now, let's see if this picks this up here. Once mobile input is true, Notice it's triggered off a change in my environment. I'm going to say reload because mobile input is now true. And so uh, it enables this cross-platform in input controller inside of Unity. I'm going to reload all that. That value is now true. If you are familiar in C Sharp uh, with preprocessor directives, preprocessor constants, that essentially has enabled one in our code that we can use. And if we look at, um, let's find this guy throughout. cross-platform input, an uh, editor mobile input, and mobile input. So the fact that we have these enabled means Unity has a cross-platform input class behind the scenes. And what happens is when it's enabled, uh, it will read from uh, virtual settings on mobile. And I'll show you what the interface looks like that. And when it is not enabled, it just reads essentially the standard input. But it maps to this virtual class here, which I think I have the name that I copied out here, just to make this a little bit easier for you to see here. This was, um, yeah, like this. 
Let me search in my entire solution, find all. So there's a cross-platform input manager. This is essentially the virtual interface that all of your code calls into to find out if it has a button down or button up 